It's time not only for our regular Sunday school Bible class period, but also continuation of our 35th annual Cane Ridge Restoration Lectureship. And we combine those, of course, with everybody from the fifth grade up this morning. We're looking forward to hearing Brother Eddie Kraft, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. We'll have a uh, song and a prayer. David will lead us in a song, and Brother Bill Corman will lead us in prayer, and then Eddie will speak to us. Eddie is very well known to most of us. He's been associated, known people in this congregation since uh, even before I was here. So you, many of you know him well. He spoke last night in a wonderful way. We are looking forward to him here this morning in Bible class. Eddie is from Tennessee. We love him anyway. Uh, he, he has the courtesy not to wear orange while he is here, and we respect that in a, in a big way. Eddie's uh, very active and serving the Lord in so many ways, a weekly television program called Biblical Viewpoints, a weekly radio program called Arise to Truth. We have a special uh, tie because he was for 25 years, that right, the preacher to Elizabeth in Tennessee, where uh, Josh and Megan, my son, daughter-in-law, grandchildren attend, and he did a good job of uh, helping to, to nurture a wonderful congregation there where they're very happy in, in serving the Lord and we check in with each other from time to time, and we, we appreciate the work he does in congregational preaching. Right now, he's full-time with the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development, full-time instructor and co-director of that school, training young men, both in spiritual growth and particularly to preach the gospel. We look forward to hearing Brother Eddie as he continues our theme, this uh, Cane Ridge Lectureship, of Stand Fast. He's going to talk to us about stand fast in the truth in just a moment. David. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my will and make it Thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is Thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the beautiful weather we've had during this Cambridge lectureship. We thank you, Father, for all the visitors that came and our members too. And we've enjoyed, Father, the preaching and the teaching. And uh, we know, Father, we've been edified and we've been uplifted. Uh, we pray, Father, that this will cause us to want to have a closer and walk with thee and to have a greater love for souls and the salvation of others. Help us, Father, to truly have the love in our heart for mankind. Uh, help us, Father, to always seek the lost if we have an opportunity. We pray, Father, you be with the speakers, uh, be with Eddie this morning, and I pray, Father, he can say the words that we need to hear, Father, that will uh, enlighten us to a better knowledge and uh, to know more about, Father, about your will and your word and to look at things in a different perspective. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, the visitors that have come our way will have safe journeys today back home and uh, have good health, Father, and we pray that this church, Father, can 
grow in spirit and truth and number. Uh, we can be a light set up on the hill, Father, for others to see. May we uh, always know what it is to be a servant, Father, to you first and mankind second. We love you, Father. We love your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, you'll bless us. And whatever we do is right and defeat us what is wrong. Help us, Father, to stand up against others, Father, that do wrong and tell them they're wrong and, and always stand for what's right, Father, and fight for what's right. Uh, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. He gave his life for us, Father. We should give what we can in the fight for righteousness and to fulfill, Father, the good things in this world. And hopefully Christians, Father, can stand up, unite to be a closer knit uh, to fight Satan as he approaches us, Father, from every front. We pray, Father, our politicians can be men, Father, that are man, uh, God-loving, God-serving people, and that we can uh, turn, Father, back to the truth and uh, have a great revival, Father. Bless us during the rest of this day, Father, and as we go out to the Cambridge Meeting House, we pray, Father, that uh, we can have memories, Father, of what those who went before us and done and to uh, maybe share some of the things that they felt when they were there many, many years ago. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, we can always be light in a world of darkness. In Christ's name we ask it be thy will. Amen. I thought this morning that I'd just get down here amongst you. You look a lot different close up. I told uh, the congregation in Elizabethan one time they were a good looking audience. And I also then expressed how it's easier to preach to a good looking audience than an ugly one. And of course, there's one in every crowd, and one of the ladies came out and said, you ought to be where we were looking that direction. <laughs> so I tried to be a little more cautious. Man, it's great to be here. I appreciate this congregation, the good eldership, each member, the work you do, the youth that you have here, and we appreciate you so much. I bring you greetings from the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. We've got five new students coming in. Our students are doing well. We now have them in a number of states. Our school began in 202, and uh, we're in the upper eastern part. Sometimes we've been confused with the East Tennessee School of Preaching, so they changed their name. And, uh, but we're the Tri-City School of Preaching right in Bristol, Kingsport, Johnson City, upper East Tennessee. If you go any further than where we are, you're in Carolina, or you're in Virginia, or you're in Kentucky. And so we're right on the line. It's a beautiful area. And if you're interested, come and look our school over sometime. We would be happy to have you. I appreciate Logan being with me. Logan is our oldest grandson. When grandma can't travel with me, she sends him. And so she tries to send him often so that he can kind of keep me uh, in the right direction. But uh, appreciate Logan's willingness to do that. Logan's brother, Dylan, will be starting our school, and we look forward to that. And if you're interested in preaching the gospel, let us know. We'd be happy to come talk with you, come down and look the school over, and uh, we would be glad to have you come and be with us at any opportunity that you have. As any school, we're always needing students and finances, so if you can help any student or do anything in those areas, uh, be sure to keep that in mind, but especially through your prayers and work that you do. This is a tremendous lectureship. The Cane Ridge lectureship. And you cannot think about Cane Ridge and the restoration movement without thinking about the awesome price that was paid that we could have this kind of liberty and this kind of freedom. And we appreciate the men that have preceded us. They observe that there's a lot of things wrong in their religious world. They claimed to believe in the same God, but they did not believe the same 
ideology. They did not have the same doctrinal views, and they said something must be wrong. And they began to go back to the Bible and found interesting, they found it interesting that they recognized that there are other folk in other areas that feel the very same way that we feel. And so they began to join forces. I was in a location in Tompkinsville, Kentucky not long ago, and we went out to the old Mulkey meeting house where John Mulkey and others pulled away from denominational era, and on that one occasion, about 100 people to 150 realized something's wrong, but the Bible is right. And they decided that they were going to follow New Testament Christianity, and that's what they did. And it was wonderful to go by the old Mulkey meeting house. It was exciting to go by the graveside where John is buried and to observe the restoration history that existed there. And so these men realized the value of truth. Our topic this morning is to stand fast in the truth, Galatians 5, 7 to 10. And we'll read those verses in just a moment. As we did last evening, we're going to do a textual discussion. We'll explain the importance of truth in achieving and maintaining Christian faithfulness. Secondly, the practical applications will explore practical ways for standing fast in the truth that promotes Christian maturity. We will notice some of those things that's described in Galatians 5.25 as living or walking in the Spirit. And the textual discussion will explain the value and the importance of truth in achieving and maintaining this Christian faithfulness. Now let's notice together the text. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you, now watch it, should not obey the truth? Obey the truth. Someone hindered them that they should not obey the truth. Now there's one or two sides to this coin. There's error and there's truth. Now you flip the coin. You decide whether you want to follow that which is truth or that which is error. And we'll set forth to show you the evidence is very clear that if you wish to, you may know the truth. Truth is not something that God hid away from mankind, but it's something he revealed to us. He's on our side. He wants us to know the truth. And so someone was hindering them that you should not obey the truth. He says this persuasion did not come from him that called you. And then he made the observation that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That is, if you're being removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, if it is the case that you have become foolish because you're no longer following the truth, then it's not going to be long till others will become like you are. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We've been told, and it's true, one untaught generation leads the church of Christ into apostasy. Now that says a tremendous thing. And it is this, that we should stand for the truth. We should study the truth and know it. Listen, if you take your New Testament and if you'll read nine chapters out of it every day, you can read your New Testament once a month for the rest of your life. Nine chapters. Remember, I'd already begun to do this. About a year ago, I started doing that because I wanted to read the New Testament through once a month the rest of my life. And Jeff Archie got on the Internet on his Facebook, and he said, I would like to offer a challenge to all that's on the Facebook to read nine chapters of your New Testament every day. And then he pointed out that you would read the New Testament through once a month. You'd actually be a little ahead of that. But if you do that, you're going to richly be blessed from it. And then you can throw in a few Old Testament passages along the way as well. But read your New Testament. If you don't read it, you're not going to know it. Now, there's more involved than just reading your Bible. We know that, but you certainly can't know it if you don't read it. So read your Bible. Do not allow a day to go by that you do not read your New Testament or your Bible and read it carefully. And so he says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so if you don't read your Bible, then that will encourage others not to read their Bible. Moms and dads, when our children and grandchildren see us reading our Bibles and praying together and studying the Word of God, this motivates them to want to do the same thing. Some 
children will tell you rather quickly, I've never seen mom and dad pray. Never saw a mom and dad read the Bible. Never saw a mom or dad attend the services of the Lord's church. Doesn't get any sadder or bleak than this. We need to read our Bibles. We need to study our scriptures so that we can know them and so that we can have an impact in our society and in particular in our families. And so we need to see to it the word of God is taught. Now he goes on. He says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. I have confidence in you though, or through the Lord, that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Now notice he said, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you would be no otherwise minded. Underline the word minded. The word minded means you're going to be of a sound mind. Now the Bible says that the word of God is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8 verse 11. If the word of God is the seed of the kingdom, then the word of God is designed to be planted. It is to be planted in the heart. Now the heart is the mind, not the blood pump. I was preaching one time and I said, we need to understand Satan wants to take the word out of our hearts. And a little child punched his mom and said, he don't know the difference between his head and his heart. Well, that gave her an opportunity to point out this is the heart. This is the Bible heart, the mind, the intellect of man, not the blood pump. Our blood pump will cease to pump one of these days and we're going to die. That's what happens. But we're going to be alive spiritually somewhere. We're still living just in a different situation. Body separated from spirit, but the spirit returns to God who gave it, and therefore we still will be living in eternity. And so listen, the word of God is planted in the heart. This is a battle of the mind. This morning you have a good heart or a bad heart. And therefore a good heart and an honest heart are a heart that's not good and honest. And Paul was of a sound mind thinking that these folks would be minded. They would be of no other mindset. They would have their mind upon the word of God. The word of God would be in their mind, in their hearts, would be guiding them and governing their every move. Now listen, John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know. Look at that. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus didn't say, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. You shall assume the truth, and that assumption shall make you free. He said, you can know the truth. Now, I know that there are those today that do not believe that you can know anything. Well, I certainly don't want them trying to tell me anything, do you? I had one of these fellows at a preacher's meeting one time. He said, we can't be absolutely sure about anything. I said, are you sure about that? Well, he didn't know what to say. See, he's in a vacuum, and he cannot prove his proposition because if he proves his proposition, then that's something you can know. Brother Deaver used to beautifully say, when someone tells you you can't know the truth, just know it anyway. And that's what we should do because Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you're my disciple indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is something we can know. God told Adam and Eve the truth in the Garden of Eden. Could they know it? Surely they could. They didn't follow it, but they knew it. And from that time on, God has given us his word. And his word is very clear. Now, we asked the question. Pilate asked it a long time ago, and it was asked even before that time. But what is truth? Have you ever thought about that? What is truth? Well, Jesus answers that question, so he doesn't leave it up to human ingenuity or own ideology. But he says, that you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. But in his prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, John 17, Jesus praying to his heavenly Father in verse 17 of John 17 said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth. If God's word is the truth, and it is, then every word that contradicts that or goes against that is error. Now, do you see why Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another gospel. And so here we see that they had become foolish in that they were being removed from what they had once received and had begun to walk in. And so truth is the word of God. Now, let's connect truth and faithfulness together. To do that, go to John 
chapter 6. We're going to connect truth, God's word, that which is right, to that faithfulness. Now, we want to emphasize to you again that you can have truth without being faithful, but you cannot be faithful to God without having the truth. And so people can say what they want to, do what they want to, but if they don't have the truth, they cannot be faithful to God Almighty. Now let's watch what happened. There was a tremendous occurrence that takes place in John 6. We'll emphasize 53, 54, verse 60, and 66, okay? We'll emphasize verses 53 and 54, verse 60, verse 66. But now notice what happens. Jesus says in verse uh, 53, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you shall eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Now, hopefully, you already understand this is figurative language. Jesus was not trying to teach cannibalism. It wasn't about really eating his literal flesh or drinking his literal blood. That's not what he's emphasizing. He's emphasizing the fact I'm the bread of life, the water of life, I'm the door, I am. And so you got to come to me, partake of me, or else you cannot be what God wants you to be. But now, these folks had a little difficulty with this, and you're going to have difficulty anytime you try to literalize figurative language. Make no mistake about it. And so they tried to understand what Christ was saying in a literal sense. Verse 60, the Bible says, many therefore, not some, not a few, but many, of his disciples. A disciple is a learner. He's a follower. You know, John had disciples. And the disciples of John listened to John, followed John, believed the teaching of John. The disciples of Christ were those that heard Christ, followed Christ, believed what Christ taught. Now you're going to find that sometimes when people have a disbelief or they do not accept any longer, what the Word of God says, there'll be a departure. And it's like John said, they were not of us, for had they been of us, they would not have departed from us. But they departed from us, which shows they were not of us. Well, why did they depart from them? The only reason they would have had for departing from the apostles and the faithful, they could no longer abide by their teaching. And so they departed. Now, when they departed, that showed they were not of them. Had they been of them, they would have stayed. And had they believed what they taught, they would have stayed. But they didn't. And so John gets into that discussion in 1 John. And so here these disciples are. And there's many of them, when they heard the teachings of Christ, when they heard this, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Now, what's hard about it? What's hard about this saying? Except so you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no life in you. If you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have everlasting life, I'll raise you up at the last day. What's hard about that? Well, there's nothing really hard about it unless you don't understand it. You take it literal. And that's what they did. Now watch verse 66. From that time, many, that's the many of verse 60. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. No more. They refused to walk with him. You see what happened here? They had the word of God. They believed the word of God. They were disciples of Christ. And they followed Christ. But when they disagreed with something Christ taught, they departed to walk with him no more. They had the truth. They were faithful to God. They no longer believed the truth. And they departed from God. There is your connection between truth and faithfulness. And so you cannot have faithfulness to God. What they did when they walked away, they ceased to be faithful and loyal to God Almighty and made the biggest mistake they had ever made. Now, if we could recall this many disciples out of eternity today and talk to them face to face, you know what they'd tell you? Be faithful to the Lord. Follow his instructions. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you disagree with the word of God, you better get your life in tune with 
the word of God. Now, notice Christ didn't say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, come back, come back. Numbers are more important than truth. And there are many of you people, so come on back and I'll change my message to fit your lives, okay? Did he do that? He was not about to change the word of God to suit the lives of people who did not believe in it, even when there were many of them. We cannot change God's word because the majority may not like it. I didn't write it, so I sure can't apologize for it. It cost John the Baptist his head, cost Jesus Christ his life, cost Stephen his life, caused the disciples many difficulties. Even in the letter we're studying this week, Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of our Lord Jesus Christ. He had been beaten, in some occasions, left for dead. Not because he committed some hideous crime, but because he was a Christian. And so there was problems. And these people were not going to walk with the Lord no more, and they decide they're going to depart. And so Paul now is asking the churches of Galatia, who has hindered you from walking in the truth? Who hath bewitched you? What is it now that has come upon you that has caused you some difficulties relative to that which is the truth? Now these Judaizing teachers had begun to take their toll upon them. We cannot grow, we cannot stand in faithfulness without studying and obeying the Word of God. One of my favorite statements in the Bible is, buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, 23. Do you buy the truth? Do whatever it takes to get truth, ascertain truth, know truth, live in harmony with that truth. And then once you get it, don't ever sell it. Keep it. Pay whatever price has to be paid. Because that's involved in our growing and our doing that which is right in the sight of God. And so we see the connection between truth and faithfulness. But now let's take it further and let's notice a practical, uh, practical application here of how this knowing the truth promotes maturity. Now, maturity just means completeness or manhood as it's used in the scripture. Sometimes the word perfect is used when that which is perfect is come. And so we have a contrast. Now, I alluded to this last night, but I want you to turn to the fifth chapter, the book of Hebrews, and let's look at how knowing the word of God, studying the word of God, growing in God's grace and God's knowledge is a part of truth and how we must have that truth in order to do that now paul in addressing the hebrew christians and they were much like the galatians they were made up mostly of the jewish uh background and so they had been encouraged to go back into judaism and some of them had done that and yet paul's writing to them in galatians the churches of galatia was to maintain christian maturity and the same thing's true of the book of hebrews the book of hebrews is written to say look why would you turn back now the best is yet to come and to hold out to them what the old covenant said about the new covenant and how that it emphasizes from its own teaching that they were trying to go back to that the new testament is better better priesthood better covenant better ethical system better everything because jesus christ was the fulfillment and culmination of the old. And so here is a beautiful thing that is set forth. Now watch the Hebrew writer, though, in verse 12 of the fifth chapter. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. Notice the word teach. You teach that which can be known. Well, there was a time when the Hebrew Christians should have been teachers. You ever know anyone like that? Should have been a teacher, but wasn't a teacher and couldn't be a teacher because they had not studied. Can't teach without studying. And so they needed to be teachers. Now watch. But you had need that one teach you again. Well, that's bad enough, but notice the first principles of the oracles of God. That is, you had to be taught your ABCs all over again. You should have known these simple 
rudiments, fundamentals, and you didn't. Now, let me tell you something, folks. N.B. Hardeman was right on the money many years ago when he said, don't ever underestimate the ignorance of your audience. Now, he didn't say that in meaning, in a bad meaning way. He was just saying, don't assume your audience knows something. Because they may not. And we found out real quickly in teaching in the Tri-City School of Preaching, you don't assume those students know anything. <laughs> now, some of them are very brilliant. But some of them don't know the books of the Bible. Some of them do not know that Ruth is one of the books of the Bible. And so we get some very elementary folks sometimes relative to scriptures. Now, some of these kids have been brought up in the church for a long time. I asked one student one day, what chapter in the book of Acts do we read about the establishment of the Lord's church? And he had no idea. It was a preacher's kid, but now it wasn't he, so I'll tell you that in Cheryl's. They knew. So I'll race that off right quickly, okay? <laughs> of course, they knew that before they sent them. One day I had to fill in uh, for Wesley and some of them in English. Cheryl happened to call Adam that day, and Adam said, you'll never guess what's going on. And Cheryl said, what's that? He said, Eddie Kraft is teaching English. And Cheryl said, don't believe to a thing he says. <laughs> but don't underestimate the ignorance of your audience. And elders, preachers, listen. We need to make sure that our young folk and our congregations are taught the fundamentals. They need to be taught the fundamentals. They need to know the books of the Bible, the kings, the judges, and all those good things. They need to be putting them in their memory bank, and it's all easier to do that when you're young than when you get my age. And so you need to study. You need to get the first principle. The foundation is important. And if the foundation is correct, the building will stand. So we've got to get this right. And so he says you need to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. That is, they are mature. They're full grown. Even those who by reason of use, use, reason, reason, using the reasoning process, using the mind, studying the word, reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern between the good and the evil. Now, why is it the case that in our generation, it seems like the good is called evil and the evil is called good? Why is it the case that we cannot distinguish? Why does it just shake you sometimes when you see uh, someone on TV promoting error and people acting as if, oh, that's wonderful. How can we set by in the Lord's church and abortion is bad enough, but then see those little babies cut up and their body parts sold and it not appall us at our very being? Why are people not put in jail? I can do a lot less than that and get locked up today. And someone comes up and says, look, these people are killing babies and selling their body parts. And they say, we better investigate the people that took the videos. When are we going to investigate the people that are doing it? But I say that to say this, ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time where people have not used their senses. They've not exercised them, and they're not able to discern between the good and the evil. And so it's left wide open. Do whatever you want to do. There's no right or wrong anymore. You just do whatever you want to do, and it'll be okay. And all of that stuff sometimes comes out of the evolutionary theory, but that's another sermon for another time. But the problem here we see is the reason the Christians in the first century had not developed to where they needed to be was they were not using and exercising their minds. That was the problem, the whole problem. And it's our problem today. We've got out of studying the Bible, doing what the Bible says, making sure we know the Word of God says this, and we've gone along with what I used to be involved in when I was growing up, all about feelings and the hoopla of the moment and entertainment. Entertainment doesn't save. The gospel saves. Romans 1, 16, 17. 
So we've got to teach our children the Word of God. Now, I appreciate so much the fact that God has been so careful for man to receive the truth that he, after Christ was called back into heaven, sent his Holy Spirit into our world to guide, to guide, to protect, to see to it that truth was given. John 16, 13, Howbeit, when either the spirit of truth is come, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. When the Holy Spirit comes to guide the apostles, he's not going to speak of himself. And I wondered why when I grew up in denominationalism, all we talked about was the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit said he's not going to talk about himself. But whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak. He'll show you things to come. He guided the apostles into all truth. And today we have that all truth, don't we? Remember Brother Blankenship, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17? We have all scriptures, 2 Peter 1, 3. Everything that pertains to life and unto godliness, he has given it to us. God has seen to it that we have the word of God. Do what God says and love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. And guess what? You're going to be all right. Follow his instruction, his teaching. It allows others to see Christianity in you. It glorifies God as we love and follow his precious word. We need to follow it. I want you to turn with me to John 6. John chapter 6. And I want you to really make a note of this, and I promise you that if you will do what we're about to read, and you will put these verses in your memory bank, they will be a blessing to your life. One of the tremendous reasons why Christianity or the Word of God, rather, is so important to New Testament Christianity is because Christianity is a taught religion. Christianity is a taught religion. It's not just a, something better felt than told. It's not just a cliche. It's not just a name. You know, we've taken the name Christian. It means nothing anymore. We're talking about a Christian nation, a Christian this, and a Christian that. We don't understand how the Bible uses the term because been so abused but when we think about New Testament Christianity and the significance and the value of it then we got to make a very important understanding relative to it now I want you to look verses 44 and 45 there'll be no verses in the Bible that'll be more valuable to you and more important than these Jesus said unto them Verily, verily, I say unto you, except. Now underline the word except. There are many exceptive clauses in your Bible. You remember Jesus used one of them, didn't he, in his discussion with Nicodemus? Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. Now what does that mean? When you have an exceptive clause, if you remove the exception, to understand it, you have Jesus saying no man can enter the kingdom. If there's not an exception to that, you can't get there. When Jesus says to these people, except, then you mark it down, without the exception, whatever he's about to say can't be done. Jesus said, if a man puts away his mate and marries another, he commits adultery. Except, it would be for fornication. Now, we understand the acceptive clause in our everyday life, I hope. Maybe you drive up to a parking spot and it says no parking except handicapped. Does that mean that no one can park there? Well, no one but the handicapped. Or you might see a sign as you drive up to a university, no parking except faculty. Do you have any trouble understanding that you can't park there unless you're a part of the faculty? Was that the first bill? I better hurry. Five minutes. There's no way. <laughs> on Van Dusen Hill on Signal Mountain, Tennessee, and I was a boy growing up, there was a sign at the top of Van Dusen Hill said, Stop. 
But you say, what's unusual about that? Well, I'm not through. It says, except right turn. Now, even old country boy on Signal Mountain could understand that. You stop there unless you were turning right, except right turn. Now, I tell people, you know what a stop sign means in Carter County and Elizabethan, Tennessee? Absolutely nothing. Trust me, absolutely nothing. If somebody puts his blinker on, don't you believe it for a moment. That's just a temptation for them to get you as soon as you pull out. We don't have any trouble with the accepted clause. So he said, no man can come to me except. That means no one can come to Jesus Christ except. Except for what? Except the Father which sent me draw him. Now if the Father that sent me doesn't draw him, he can't come. I don't care who he is. Okay? And I'll raise him up the last day. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know how the Father draws? If I can find out how the Father draws, then I know how people can come to Christ. Well, let's listen. It is written in the prophets. They all shall be market taught. They shall all be taught. Who's the all? The ones that want to come to Christ. Well, I didn't think anyone could come to Christ. They can't except the Father that sent them drawing. So it shows we have to be taught of God. Every man. Who's the every man? Well, that's the all of the preceding statement. Every man, therefore, that hath heard. Underline it. Taught. Heard. You got to be taught, you got to hear. Everyone, every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned. There's your three important words. They have to be taught. You can't be taught without hearing. And then you learn. Now, watch. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and learned of the Father does what? He comes to me. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. How does the Father draw him? Through his being taught, through his hearing the word of God, and through his learning it. Christianity is a taught religion. And that's how the Father calls. And you don't have to even guess about it. You have it right there. And it's been there the whole time in your Bible. On a rise to truth each Tuesday and Thursday. And by the way, you can... Go on arisetotruth.com and listen to our program every Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 3 o'clock. You can call in, ask your about your comments. We've had about eight denominational preachers that have been converted to truth. Tell them what the Bible says. But a gentleman called in and used those verses. There. They said, I'm happy to tell you I'm a Christian because I've been drawn by the Father. Well, we didn't know what he was going to say. I've been drawn by the Father. We said, well, how did that come about? He said, I got my Bible. I heard, I learned, and I was taught from his word, and I knew the Father had drawn me. Now that's how it's done. And we are drawn to him. We're to be conformed, not trans, uh, we're to be conformed to the word of God. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed in, but be conformed to the gospel. Let it change your lives. And do not be deceived, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. And so the word of God is immensely important. It will judge us in the last day. John 12, verse 48. The books will be opened, Revelation 20 and verse 12. It's by the word of God that we are begotten, James 1, 18. It's by the word of God that we are born again, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. The judgment of God will be according to truth, Romans 2, 2. And so when you put all of this together and tons of other stuff, of course, it's obviously clear the Lord has provided the truth for us. But it's up to us to go get it. It's up to us to learn it, to study it, to love it, to live it, so that we can be what God would have us to be. You've been such a great audience this morning, and we appreciate your presence, and we'll continue in a moment in our worship assembly.